Hey guys, this is Brian with Better Chess Training. In this video, we're going to conclude our series on game analysis, and I'm going to be showing you steps three and four of the game analysis process. Okay, so in this uh, next step of the process, we're going to actually correct uh, and analyze the areas that we looked at in, um, in the previous step, which was to identify the key areas. And the first thing I always look at is the opening uh, because this is something that will definitely be able to apply in future games and uh, just a couple points I want to make about that uh, and here what you see is uh, I've cropped the screen a little so you can just see the relevant parts but this is actually chess tempo uh, they have a chess database and what I'll do is I'll see if the opening is in my um, you know opening repertoire and I have several books uh, and websites that I go to for uh, my specific repertoire at the moment and um, if I can't find it there or to supplement it, I'll go to Chess Tempo and look up some games. So this is a position here um, that I picked up, and let me just show you what I do. And the idea here is not just to get uh, the moves, and I'll talk about this later and maybe give you one more example, but also to understand the ideas by why uh, your opponent's move or your move is not the best. So let's take a look at this uh, position, and I'll go through it. So this is from the game, uh, and what I did was uh, te Chess Tempo actually allows you to uh, copy the PGN of the game into um, into the database, and then you can scroll through and look at the different positions. So uh, here we'll go, uh, this is after Black had played C5, and I had mentioned in the last video that this is kind of a Benoni structure, and uh, it continues to be so. And you can see in uh, the screen to the right, you can see the results from the database. And you can see that we're playing, um, and he plays b6. It's not uh, the most popular move, but there's still some games. And these are, all of these games are players with uh, FIDE ratings of 2,200 and above. So these are all master games that we're looking at here. Um, bishop to d3 was played, and that was the best move. And bishop to b7 was what my opponent played as the second best move. And we can see here that uh, my uh, the best move in the position is e6 and so what you can do there is for future research and it depends on you know what level you're at and how deep you want to go into your openings uh, you can look at this alternative and study some games from there uh, but let's go back to the game bishop to b7 okay castles and we can see here this transposes into um, more uh, more games we can see there's over a thousand games played from this position. Uh, kind of a combination, uh, this could go into kind of Queen's Indian territory or as my opponent plays g6 here, uh, more of um, Benoni territory. So uh, the idea here is that, again, you wanna kind of take a look at how this opening goes. You, um, I would downplay the results per se when you look at these databases, but look for the ideas. Try to understand the ideas behind it. Obviously, if you're a more advanced player, you're going to understand the ideas behind your openings. If you're um, a beginning player or this is a new opening for you, you want to study a few of the games, which you can find like on a database like Chess Tempo. So you might want to click on a few of the games, look for some high-rated uh, games or players you know who play the openings that you like, and then... Study those games and try to find the ideas. Obviously, if you have a good uh, opening book or a chess coach you work with, then you can find the ideas from there as well. Um, and let me just get to the position uh, that I was looking at here. So as we move through this opening, um, we find that we're getting um, the best moves. Now here, the move that I played in the game was rook to e1, which is actually the third... Uh, best move in the game, or the, not the third best, but the third, third uh, uh, most popular choice. The best choice, or the, the most popular choice, is queen to e2. And this actually falls in line with um, some of my other repertoire choices, and it's probably something I should have played. So knight to c6, and here d to c c5 is played, but rook to d1 is also played. So um, part of what I will do is look at this and maybe the next time I uh, work with my coach when we look at this game try to understand this 
position more. So that's kind of the first thing you want to, or one of the first things you want to do because uh, your opening is, if you, especially if you have a repertoire that you're working with, is something that you're going to find these positions in future games. So this is one way I look at it. Again, uh, using the database uh, to look for it. Also books. And again, if you work with a coach, you can, of course, uh, ask him, especially if uh, he or she has uh, helped you to develop your repertoire. So that's the first point when you're analyzing your games and correcting the positions is trying to understand where you might have gone wrong in the opening or where your opponent went wrong and then try to see where you could have gone and explored from there and that will deepen your opening knowledge. The next position we're going to look at is uh, from the middle game uh, of our game here and uh, I wanted to make a note here about using uh, chess engines because I, I talked to a lot of people and uh, a lot of times uh, especially if they're not working with a coach, they um, use uh, chess engines to help analyze their games, which uh, I do too, so it, I'm not here to say that it's a bad thing, but we have to be uh, careful about relying on the results of the chess engines too much. Uh, it could be, uh, and, and the idea here is not that they're, I'm not saying that chess engine moves are always bad or that they're uh, even, they're bad a lot of the time, but the, the key is when you're analyzing your game is not just to find the best moves or, or to find good moves, although that is a goal of what you're trying to do here, but also understanding why so that you could produce these moves uh, for yourself in the games. So you want to, I always recommend doing a little analysis by yourself uh, before you um, consult with the chess engine or even with other players. I would uh, look at it yourself and try to understand why the move you played was not the best. So we're going to do that a little with this position. And let's take a look here. Um, and I already analyzed this position, so I'll show you what I found. Uh, I played queen to c1 here with the idea that um, I would play bishop to a3. Uh, and I even remember, I went through the video of the game, and I even noted to myself, well, the problem with that is if bishop takes a3, so let's say... Uh, here he plays queen to g7, and I, I, and I figured this out on the next move, but let's say I played bishop to a3. Well, he could play um, bishop takes a3, queen takes a3, and just something like queen to c7, and that c file that I had owned uh, for the game up to this point, now he can enter on there, and I can't really contest it. Uh, now, in this particular position, I might get some counterplay here by bringing my queen in, but the idea here that the idea, initial idea behind queen to c1, so let's go to that. Queen to c1 trading, um, trying to trade these, it was not a bad idea, but what I, if I wanted to follow through with that, uh, a better idea to follow up with that might have been something like knight to b1. Uh, however, I, doing some additional analysis, I actually found that um, this idea was maybe something that I should have delayed. Um, and so getting back to it, it, so yeah, queen to c1 wasn't the best idea. What I should have done maybe was looked at uh, activating some of my other pieces. And, and one way to do that, or a, a way that I found, was knight to e5. I found this idea when I was analyzing on my own, realizing, uh, and the, the thought process there was, uh, my idea of trading these bishops are there other ideas? So when you're analyzing your games, uh, you don't just randomly look at moves, but you want to look at, do I, are there other plans on the board? And the plan here is to improve my knight position. And at first I thought, well, uh, he just takes it. But then as I analyze, and let's take a look here, you can take with the knight or the bishop. If he takes with the knight, then I win a piece because of this fork. Uh, if he takes with the bishop, then after d takes e5 um, and knight to e8, then I could play f4, which strengthens uh, my position in the center. And now my idea would be to bring my knight around. And now, because he got, because I got rid of his bishop, um, he, he does get to improve his knight. Then I have um, this diagonal, and I can get my bishop in. And after queen to c7, kind of... Uh, now he can get his queen here, and knight to f3, my knight goes to d4, and I could always chop this off at any point. Uh, for example, um, let's see here, if you were, well, if you were, say, to attack here, I can play something like this, 
and then after a few exchanges, then I might uh, want to push here. Well, actually, this is winning, so he wouldn't play that. But the point is that uh, is to understand the ideas behind the moves and understand why a move is being um, played a certain way. Um, and then if you want to use the chess, the chess engines to make sure that you don't have any blunders in your analysis, then that's fine. But don't use the, I guess my recommendation is not to um, use the chess engines first um, to, to look for things. The only, I, I don't mean to have too many uh, views about this, but I, I think it's important. The only thing I would use it for, and I, I do occasionally, especially if I'm playing blitz games, is to just quickly go through a game and find blunders. And then you can kind of see, you know, ha have that be a point of uh, where you can start analysis, but not to necessarily find the moves right away. Uh, I really think you need to develop that skill of thinking on your own and, and develop your critical thinking skills. So this is um, a position where uh, the move I had made was not the best move. And from analysis, I found a better move. And, and by analyzing it on my own, I actually strengthened my own chess knowledge. Okay, having said all that about uh, the chess engines and cautioning you there, I do want to point out a position where uh, chess engines can be very helpful. And typically those are positions with forcing lines and tactics. Uh, so here's a position, um, actually it's a couple moves earlier in the game. And uh, during the video I mentioned that I was thinking of ideas of playing queen to c6. And trying to time that was um, always difficult. So I'm going to show you here that uh, after analyzing this position, I had played a4, which is definitely a fine move and, and fairly logical to strengthen this. Uh, but actually, uh, the chess engine pointed out after I had done some analysis that queen to c6 would have been very good here. Um, not necessarily winning, but probably uh, one of the better moves in the position. So let me show you some of that analysis. Queen to c6, and the idea here is that um, obviously if he takes, then uh, after b takes c6, uh, if he were to move back, then I just go ahead and I'm going to be promoting this pawn. And so that was kind of the idea there, and had I had more time during the game, hopefully I would have found that. But um, the computer gives queen to b8 because obviously trading that queen is a losing move um, and then after this the problem with this move is that now I get um, knight to e5 in and so we're seeing here this theme of knight to e5 um, positionally it's making a lot more sense now I was always afraid of it being exchanged but as if we see here after this exchange this knight now can't go back to c7, it gets kind of displaced. If it goes to h5, it's going to be out of the action for a while. Uh, for example, if he plays h5, um, I could even play something like, um, well, I could think about something like g4 to push it back further, and that locks it out of the game for a while. Um, or even something um, just like knight to f3 with the idea of getting my knight to uh d4, or even now that my queen is in um, in here, I can think of something like knight to g4 at some point. So um, queen to c6 has a, uh, it, the timing of it would have been right in this position. So this is something, um, again, that the chess engine could point out moves that maybe you weren't thinking of or can help confirm ideas that you had, uh, but I just don't want you to get too over-dependent upon it. So I guess that's the uh, moral of the story there. Okay, let's let's move on. Okay, here's a position from uh, the end game. And uh, during the game, I played... Uh, so let's actually go back a move here. I played uh, g4 to prevent this knight from coming into f5. Now, uh, that move is uh, was okay. Um, there's actually some alternatives to that, but the point I want to make here is, um, is this is where you can use other resources to help besides uh, the chess engine, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, in this case, uh, black played f5, and here I had played h3, and at this point in the game, I think my time was getting a little low, so maybe I was playing quickly. But notwithstanding, we could still learn something from it. And he immediately played f takes g4, 
h takes g4 and then h5 and this is an excellent move uh, because now he's creating an outside pass pawn and as we saw in the game that it ended up being uh, quite decisive so going back so here we could see what the problem was and now we can look at different solutions so um, the one that i actually thought of during the game considered but i rejected was to play f3 and then if h, h, f takes g4 f takes g4 the pawn structure is fairly um is fairly symmetrical but uh, this bishop might give me a little bit of an edge. So part of this also is understanding, besides the moves that you're playing, you also want to understand where you are in the game, where you stand in the game. Uh, I think in this position during the game, I was probably thinking that I had a big, bigger edge than I really did. So that's why maybe I was trying to play for in a balanced position. Actually, I remember when I played h3, going back to that, um, I was thinking I wanted to keep uh, my, my pawns here intact. But the idea, this is where you want to study, uh, in this case, I want to you know, study the endgame, study the pawn endgames. And in, in a couple of the books that I've studied and, and reviewed after playing this game, uh, it, in this case, it, it's probably more important to prevent black from getting an outside pass pawn. So in this case, I considered f3, which I think is fine. Uh, another move that I might have considered here was simply g4. Um, and then if he were to try to attack it, then I can um, play something like h4. But the idea there would be that, um, you know, he's not uh, able to create that pass pawn. And it, this is basically an even endgame, but at the very least, um, one with the bishop, I can maybe hope for a little bit of an edge. And, uh, and that's sometimes, besides the moves, we also want to understand um, how we made the reasoning behind, you know, the reasons behind our move. So I think I played h3, um, again, for maybe not quite the most accurate reasons, I guess. And so um, understanding that now in future games when I'm, I'm uh, faced with this typical end game or this type of structure, I'll have this knowledge to go on. So you want to kind of capture that in your analysis when you're going through your own games. The final position I want to show you in this step of the of the uh, process uh, is uh, this one from the end game here. Again, um, a few exchanges have been made, and we can see here that um, the black has this outside passed pawn, which uh, confers a little bit of an edge, I guess you could say. Uh, I don't know if I'm quite losing here yet. I think this is uh, an even position now. But this goes back to what I was talking about in, uh, a minute ago, is that understanding your thought process, which we did in the first step, which was capturing our thoughts and our variations, is very important because now you can correct these things. Because here I played a5 with the idea that if he... Um, and this is what happened in the game, he attacks my bishop, then I can take here first. The problem was I didn't calculate far enough, but also this move was made, I think, with the idea that I was still winning the game, that I was going to try to win, and that I was being a little impatient here and trying to force some tactics and complications that uh, weren't warranted. Instead, if I uh, understood that basically this is an even end game, so I want to... Uh, I do want to try to put pressure on my opponent, but I also want to make sure I don't throw away um, the even uh, evaluation of the position. Um, I could look for something different. And in this case, the issue here is one of um, being able to get to this outside pass pawn with my king, and also one of um, putting my own pawns in a position to, to be protected and to hold this end game. Okay, so um, what I found through some analysis, uh, both with the chess engine and also looking through my endgame books uh, for some ideas, was the move f4. And the idea here is that now my king uh, will have access to the f3 square and be able to scooch around. If he ever advances this pawn, my king can now come around, whereas with my pawn on f3, this knight covers, well, let's just move it back here. Um, you can see here that uh, the knight covers uh, these squares uh, so I can't get in. So f4 from a positional standpoint makes sense, and it also makes sense tactically because now it's on a dark square where my bishop can 
uh, attack it. So I uh, put a few lines in here to, uh, or I analyzed a few lines here as examples. So king to e4 attacking, then I can just protect it. Okay, if the king tries to attack my bishop, I can just go back here, and then if he attacks me there, I can move back. And you can see here, because of this setup, the um, the black king has difficulty. And, and what I actually found here was that um, if he tries to attack my my pawns via king to b3, then now I can advance this and um, hold the game. You know, if he takes this pawn, then I take this pawn. And then if he, you can see now he's, uh, if he tries to attack, then I just push, okay? So that would be um, what I would do there. And going back to this position, if he instead attacks the bishop first, then we can see we are, we already have this vari variation, bishop to e1, and then if he attacks the pawn, again, a5 is the move that, that holds the game. And again, I'm not winning in this game, but, but it's definitely one that um, I can hold. And that knowledge of understanding uh, that, and again, that's actually come up in a few of my other games, where I was actually had even positions, but I tried to push too much to try to win. So uh, you can see here the insights aren't just getting the moves, but also seeing themes in your, uh, in your play that have maybe repeat in several games, and that's something you can work on and fix. Okay, so that concludes the uh, third um, step in the process of analyzing your games, which is to correct, correct your moves, basically. So you're, also, you're looking for the better moves to play, as well as better ways of looking at things. So you want to analyze your thoughts as well about the game and see if there's any corrections you can make. The final step is, is very important and one that uh, sometimes I think people uh, neglect, and that is to follow up or set up a system to follow up from what you've learned. And there's a few ways to do this, which I'll mention. Um, the, the first one is in the opening. And let me just go back to that opening position here. Um, so right around here is where I deviated from, from where I should have played. Here I should have played um, queen to e2, and which I looked up is in my uh, repertoire. Uh, but instead I played uh, rook to e1, which is also a, a move played in master practice, but uh, probably a slightly inferior one. So with that, I actually will look to see if that is in my um, database. And I use a tool called uh, Chessable, chessable.com, for my opening repertoire. And it uh, allows me to enter the positions, and then it will actually quiz me on the positions over time. So I check back every day, and it has certain positions to, to review. I actually wrote a review about Chessable on betterchesstraining.com, so I'll put a link there uh, for you to review. Uh, and I've talked to a few other players, including some masters who use it with their students. Uh, and they enjoy it quite a bit. But that is a way to set up so that you learn from your, op you know, you learn the mistakes that you made in the opening, but then you set up so that you will remember and not make that mistake in the future. Um, with other positions, for example, and let's go to uh, some of the positions we looked at uh, earlier today. Uh, for example, this position where queen to c6 would have been the best move to play. Um, I set up a data. Well, there's a couple things I do. I set up a database uh, called Review Database. Uh, <laughs> very creative, of course. Um, and every week, or every once in a while, this depends. Sometimes I'll do it when I'm watching TV. I'll go through the positions, and I set up uh, positions, uh, strategic positions, tactical positions, end game positions, um, things that I that come up in my games that I want to remember. And I will review those, and I'll try and go through those and try to remember why I played a certain move or why I should play that certain move. And it helps to strengthen those memories. Um, I also use software called Super Memo, um, and there's, uh, I think, free versions as well as uh, paid versions of it. And I think now there's a web version as well. But what that does is I put the positions, uh, it's not uh, a chess program specifically. People use it to learn languages or to study for tests and stuff like that. And what happens is I actually uh, I take a screenshot of the position, I put it in the software, and every day I check back and it brings up positions that I need to review. And what that does 
is uh, as I get the, po the positions, if I get the answers correct, it'll spread out how long it takes. You know, I might not need to review it for a couple months. If I get the answer wrong or I don't remember it, the software will bring it back uh, sooner, maybe within a week uh, or maybe within a couple days so that I'm constantly reinforcing those memories. So uh, part of that is selecting the right positions to review. But obviously positions that are within your opening repertoire or key tactical themes, key strategic themes are definitely things you want to remember for your future games. Um, the other thing I do is I journal uh, and I write a journal about my games and if there's some part of my thought process, this is particularly uh, helpful if you have mistakes in your thought process. Um, and let's just go to a position where I would do something like that. Let me just get to that real quick. Um, and that would be right here. So as we saw earlier, uh, I had played queen to c1 in the game, but a better move would have been knight to e5. So, you know, one of the things that I did was I reflected on it, and in my notebook I wrote, um, you know, a couple, I, I wrote a key phrase, which is, uh, think of different plans, or what, what is another plan. Uh, but I also talked about uh, why I made the moves I made, and why I perseverated on that. Now, uh, part of it too is is maybe understanding that part of this might have been time trouble, uh, but also being honest with myself and understanding that maybe this is something I have to look at in positions I can't. Um, I have to look at options, different options for plans, and then evaluate those different options to see which one is the better one. Um, later in the end game position, and let me get to that one real quick that we looked at. This is a similar idea. Here is. Um, understanding my own uh, biases, you know, thinking, you know, maybe working on my evaluation skills in the future. Um, and also asking the question, am I really winning? Is this an even position that I have to hold? In this case, like I said, this is one where black actually has the pressure and I need to hold this position. So it's a different type of mindset that I have to have than if I'm forcing, you know, trying to get complications because I think I'm winning the position. So um, self-awareness is something that analyzing your games will help you develop and also something that will help you uh, in life in general. So that's what you want to do in step four. So just to conclude, uh, I hope this was helpful. In step three, you want to try to find the best answers and um, and sometimes you might not be able to find it in the first go through. You know, you know sometimes uh, you'll have positions in your games and this happens to me all the time where you'll play another game maybe a couple months later or maybe years later and they'll say oh my goodness this you know light bulb will go off and you'll go back to another game and say this is the move that needs to be made because of this because especially if you're playing uh, you know a repertoire where you're repeating the same types of openings you'll see themes or you'll understand structures and plans of your openings uh, over time and so that's why it's important to review these things and, and try to get uh, the knowledge from the games. And that's where step four comes in. So step three, you're correcting. Step four, you are uh, setting up for follow-up. That's uh, so that you can remember the corrections you made. But also, it's a time, you know, if there's a position where you aren't quite sure about it and you can't try, try to figure it out, you might want to put that position in your database. I put those in my review database as well. And when I see those positions, I'll see if maybe time and, experience and new knowledge has helped me to understand that more uh, because uh, chess is a it's it's a lifelong endeavor if you want it to be and it's something that can help you to uh, you know improve you know, your thought processes in general and so uh, hopefully uh, this this template for analyzing your games will help you with that um, but in any case if you have any questions uh, let me know in the comments uh, and I hope that you found these uh, these practical this practical example of a uh, thought process or my anal analysis process helpful. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I hope you found this whole series on game analysis uh, helpful. And uh, I want to thank you because it's actually encouraged me to become more consistent and diligent about analyzing my own games. And so I really appreciate that. And we'll come back soon. Until our next video. Good luck with your chess.